Welcome to week three of our Lenten studies. And we're looking today at the Apostle James, the brother of our Lord. And with us to help us is the Reverend Dr. John Dixon. I wasn't able to be in the same room, but he's here on video. Uh, John, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about your family. Well, hey, Mark, thanks so much uh, for having me. Um, my family, well, uh, one wife, three kids, and um, we live in Sydney. And uh, my wife works as a kind of chaplain, pastoral care worker for an aged care facility, specializing in people with uh, dementia. Uh, I have a child out of the home working, uh, one at uni doing her master's uh, in psychology, and a little one who just started year 10. Well, she's our little one. Uh, three chickens, one dog. That's the family. And John, how did you come to realize that the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus had anything to do with you personally? Um, how did I realize Jesus' death and resurrection was for me? Uh, well, I grew up in a home that didn't have any religion at all. I'd never been inside a church before I was 15, 16. But it was my scripture teacher at school, just a state school here in Sydney, where the local church uh, offered some volunteers, uh, mostly um, middle-aged uh, and slightly older women who were gutsy enough to come and teach my class of 15-year-old rat bags about Jesus. And uh, my scripture teacher in particular was funny and smart and had answers to all my questions. And I was intrigued and um, she did the wonderful thing of uh, reading the gospels to us and allowed the person of Jesus himself to sort of leap from the page and commend himself to us. There's a much longer version of it, uh, but, that's, uh, but that's how it happened. And over the years, what have you found most helpful in terms of helping you to grow in your relationship with Christ? Um, the best thing I've found for or growing in my relationship with, with Jesus. I mean, there are lots of, uh, I guess, stock answers. You know, read the Bible, pray, uh, go to church. Um, but I'll just say two things uh, that have been surprising to me. Um, I've learned a lot from my wife's mum, uh, former missionary, um, who approaches church not for what she can get out of it, but... but um, what she can give, but also um, she just has this really encouraging spirit that even if a sermon is pretty ordinary, um, uh, she will find amazing things, amazing truths in it. She, so she's so active in finding God in, in everything. And, and so trying to emulate that has been a real help to my Christian faith um, to be looking for God's word uh, speaking to me. In, um, in all sorts of unlikely, sometimes not exciting places. And the other thing uh, that has been a surprise to me in the last, say, 10 years is a return to the prayer book. Um, I'm really quite a fan of the Book of Common Prayer and its uh, modern iterations. And so morning prayer is really the lifeblood of my devotional life. I make my wife a cup of tea each morning and we go through morning prayer together and find that that discipline has just rejuvenated our faith in, uh, in wonderful ways. Anyway, I throw that out for what it's worth. Thank you so much, John. We really look forward to you sharing with us. What I want to talk about today is James. And there are several Jameses in the New Testament. I'll talk about uh, them, but I'm going to focus on James, the brother of the Lord is the kind of title he went by. And he's um, rarely talked about, it seems, in um, modern Christian circles. But if you transported yourself back into the middle of the first century, anywhere in a church in the Roman world, and asked yourself or others, uh, who is the main figurehead of the Christian community? I'm pretty sure everyone would have said, not Paul, not even Peter, but James, the brother of the Lord, the leader of the Jerusalem church, the mother church. He had an interesting life. He wrote one epistle in the New Testament, and he ended up giving his life uh, for his own brother. Uh, more about that a little bit later. 
So I'd like to just reflect with you on uh, James, uh, both the person and the letter. And I don't know if you remember that starry eyed feeling, maybe when you were young of looking up to someone so much, you just wanted to be like them. And you had this sort of warm excitement when you thought of them. Uh, For me, it was really two figures, Uh, Bono, the lead singer from the Irish rock band U2, uh, who I thought just had the best voice, wrote the best songs. Uh, The other one was Brian Robson. Boy, did I have a starry-eyed admiration of him. He was the captain of Manchester United in the 1980s. And uh, I just, boy, I admired him. Uh, Needless to say, I live with disappointment (laughs) to this day on both my musical front and uh, on the soccer front. Well, I feel a little bit like that about James, both the person of James and the letter. Uh, James describes what I want to be like when I grow up. Uh, James describes the kind of church that I want to belong to. Um, I have that starry eyed feeling. I mean, so imagine how I felt in Oxford a few years ago when I got to handle the oldest manuscript of James. Uh, locked away in a vault in the Sackler uh, Papyri Library in uh, in the centre of Oxford, and I got to spend uh, you know an hour looking at this uh, wonderful text. And and by the way, uh, I can assure you that what was written in those very ancient ancient texts from uh, nearly two thousand years ago is the same thing uh, that you read in a modern Bible today, obviously with the translation difference. But not everyone has felt uh, as warm and fuzzy about James uh, as I do, and as I'm sure many of you do. Uh, You may or may not know that the founder of the Reformation, Martin Luther, actually described the letter of James as ein rechter Sturon epistle, a right epistle of straw, which was not a compliment. Uh, He thought that the letter of James focused way too much on good works and not nearly enough on the death and resurrection of Jesus for our free salvation by grace through faith. Now, it's true, James has famously an awful lot to say about good works. Uh, For example, in James 2, we read, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And so Luther kind of sidelined the epistle of James. I'm happy to say that the other great reformer, John Calvin, Uh, made the point that James doesn't at all contradict grace. His letter has um, a sprinkling of beautiful messages about grace. It's just that um, James emphasizes or assumes grace and then emphasizes good works. Um, Calvin sort of described it like this. It is faith alone that saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. It is always accompanied by works good works. Uh, James assumes uh, that we know grace saves and then just hits us between the eyes uh, repeatedly and rapidly about the works of faith. He offers these um, rapid fire aphorisms or proverbs throughout his epistle that are all about how to live urgently in God's world. Uh, Consider this uh, brief selection of statements from the epistle. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. James 1. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James 1.27. Or, judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful, James 2.13. Or, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up, James 4.10. And finally, with the tongue we praise the Lord and Father 
And with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? James 3, 9 and forward. Um, Does that style sound familiar? That sort of shooting from the hip, uh, aphoristic preaching about the will of God? It probably reminds you a lot of Jesus himself, who taught very often in that same uh, style, that same mood. Consider these statements. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Matthew 5, 7. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Mark 4. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Matthew 7. And everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Luke 18. And my point is Jesus was the master of this rapid fire, aphoristic style of preaching about the will of God. And James replicates that style more than anyone else in the New Testament. More than that, James has more direct allusions back to the teachings of Jesus than any other uh, biblical writer. And there is a reason for this. It is very likely that the James we're talking about is none other than James, the brother of Jesus. James introduces himself uh, in the letter simply with the words, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings, he says. So he introduces himself simply as James, the servant of God. There are three Jameses in the New Testament. This could possibly be, but it really only falls to one. Uh, There's James, the son of Alphaeus, one of the 12 apostles. He's mentioned in Matthew 10, verse 3. Then there's the James that's a little bit more known, the son uh, son of Zebedee. Uh, brother of John the Apostle. They're bo- they were both apostles, and he's mentioned in Matthew 10 too. And the third, James, is this brother of Jesus, who's mentioned in Mark uh, 6 and in several other places as well. Now, the first James, son of Alphaeus, disappears pretty much as soon as he's mentioned. We don't know what happened uh, to him. Uh, the second James was actually the first of the 12 apostles to be martyred for the, uh, for the Christian faith. He was um, killed uh, by uh, one of the descendants of Herod the Great. Um, and uh, this was in about the year 41, 42. So about 10 years after Jesus, and, and then he disappears from the scene. But it's this third James, uh, the brother of the Lord, who moves from relative obscurity in the Gospels to the most prominent position imaginable in the book of Acts, um, in passages like, I mean, if you've got the time to look up Acts 12, 17, Acts 15, 13, and Acts 21, 18, you'll see that James appears to be the central leader of the Jerusalem church. That's the mother church of the burgeoning Christian movement. And when you look at the letters of Paul and his mentions of this James, the brother of Jesus, it's clear that Paul also thinks of him as a kind of central figure in Christianity. And it's this prominence of this third James that gives him the authority to write, as he says, this circular letter to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. This is, of course, a reference to all of the Jewish Christians who are scattered outside of Jerusalem uh, around the Roman Empire. And you think, who would have the uh, authority and fame to write an official letter to all of the Jewish Christians around the Roman world? Well, the early church was unanimous that this little epistle in the New Testament was written by none other than James, the brother of Jesus. But let me step back for a little bit and um, offer a very brief account of the life of James, Uh, because I suspect that for some people, just the idea that Jesus had a brother Um, let alone one who ended up leading the church in Jerusalem, could sound a little bit strange. So here's a few things that we know about this James. First then, as you can see from this passage in Mark 6, verse 3, Jesus, in fact, had four brothers 
and at least two sisters. We read, the people of Jesus' hometown said of him, isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? The natural reading of this passage is that this is just a reference to Jesus' family. Just as Mary was his mum, uh, there were these four brothers and at least two sisters who sadly aren't named. Um, now, I should make the point that for our Roman Catholic uh, friends, um, this can sometimes be a little bit confusing because Roman Catholic doctrine ever since uh, the second century has taught that Mary remained a virgin. So uh, she couldn't have gone on to have uh, four more sons after Jesus and, uh, and these, uh, these daughters uh, that aren't named. Um, the, the simple explanation that I think Roman Catholics can uh, hold to uh, has been proposed in the ancient world uh, that um, all of these brothers and sisters were the sons and daughters of Joseph prior to marrying Mary. So maybe Joseph had all these children to a, a, a previous wife who died, and then Joseph has married uh, Mary. And that would remain uh, leave remaining that Roman Catholic doctrine of the uh, perpetual virginity of Mary. Uh, Protestants don't uh, need to think that. It's uh, quite a happy thought, really, that um, after miraculously having Jesus, Mary went on to have uh, many other uh, sons or four sons and a uh, few daughters. Anyway, they're kind of technical details. And more uh, striking than the mere fact that Jesus grew up in a pretty large household with brothers and sisters is the fact that the brothers didn't believe in Jesus during his earthly ministry. The Gospel of John uh, laments, for even his own brothers did not believe in him, John 7, 5. And it's clear that refers to his earthly brothers, not, you know, uh, disciples or anything. And the Gospel of Mark reports with even more brutal honesty, when Jesus' family heard about this, they went to cha take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Mark 3.21. So the brothers uh, of Jesus uh, thought his brother was, um, their brother was out of his mind. But then there's a remarkable turnaround in the life of James and the other brothers. They move from being skeptics or unbelievers, even thinking Jesus was mad, to actually becoming leaders of the church. And the difference was the resurrection, of course. In Acts 1.14, we learn th the apostles all joined together, constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Again, a reference to his family brothers. So what happened uh, in between the uh, period of unbelief and this mention in Acts 1 uh, of the brothers being there as worshippers? The answer is, of course, they experienced a resurrection appearance. And we can uh, thank Paul for knowing this directly. So in 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle Paul tells us that James got his own private appearance from his brother. Let me read. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Now, obviously, this James isn't one of the 12 apostles who are just mentioned. Uh, this James is a James, you can say, James, and everyone knows which James uh, is being talked about, the most famous of the Jameses, the brother of Jesus. Having seen his resurrected brother with his own eyes. James was a changed man. And um, so were the other brothers, uh, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. The next we hear about them is in 1 Corinthians 9, 5, where the apostle Paul just in passing refers to the brothers of Jesus um, traveling around as missionaries with their wives. It's a, lo a lovely thought uh, that Paul can refer to in his letter 
to the Corinthians. James wasn't a traveling missionary. James stayed in Jerusalem and over the three decades after the resurrection rose to a prominence that few of us uh, ever really contemplate. Um, uh, I honestly believe if we were transported back into the middle of the first century and asked a Christian church anywhere in Jerusalem or Rome or Alexandria, you know, who is the earthly figurehead of the church? Um, the answer is very likely to be James, the brother of the Lord, the sort of key pillar of the mother church. And we can thank Paul again in uh, Galatians 2.9 for his list of the three pillars of the church. And he lists them as James, Peter, and John. And the order isn't accidental. James is first. But we know even more than this. James was so prominent in uh, the first century that he even rated a mention in a non-Christian writing from the time. Uh, the Jewish author Josephus tells us something we wouldn't have known just from the New Testament, because from the New Testament, uh, James is alive and well. Um, uh, we don't have anything in the New Testament about how James died, but it's a non-Christian author who tells us that James died as a martyr for his faith in his brother. Here's what Josephus says. The younger Ananus, who had been appointed to the high priesthood, was rash in his temper and unusually daring. Possessed of such a character, Ananus thought that he had a favorable opportunity because Festus, the Roman governor, was dead and Albinus, the new governor, was still on his way. That means it's the year 62. And so he convened the judges of the Sanhedrin and brought before them the one named James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah and certain others. He accused them of having transgressed the Jewish law and delivered them up to be stoned to death. Those of the inhabitants of the city who were considered the most fair-minded and who were strict in observance of the law were offended at this. Isn't that extraordinary? James was martyred for his faith, and even the fellow Jews of Jerusalem were offended that the high priest would kill this James. He had um, garnered the respect of uh, other non-Christian Jews, as well as, of course, the Christian community. From cynic and unbeliever to Christian leader and martyr, that is the story of James, the brother of Jesus. And he writes this remarkable little letter sometime before his death in the year 62. And he writes to all of the Jewish Christians with this authority, having been called by the Lord himself to speak on his behalf. Now, there are so many things that we could reflect on in this letter. Wouldn't it be fun if um, Bishop Mark ever invited me to do a whole series on James for you all? You know, just putting that out there. Um, but I want to just focus on one thing uh, for us uh, today. I want to focus on how does James view Jesus. The interesting thing is he doesn't view Jesus merely as his earthly brother, but as the glorious Lord. The opening words of the letter are astonishing when you remember that James is writing about his brother. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nation's greetings. Consider this. He thinks of himself as the servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He puts them both in the same breath. He's thinking of Jesus as the exalted Lord and himself as the servant. It's an extraordinary thing. And then at the opening of the second chapter of the epistle of James, he makes another remarkable statement about Jesus. James writes, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or 
sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, there's lots of good stuff in there about favoritism and, and so on. But it's the opening line I, I want us to focus on, which is really a remarkable statement about the glory of Jesus. And it's even more powerful in the original language. A literal translation would describe us as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ of the glory. It's phrased like that to throw all the emphasis onto the words of the glory. Um, James is picturing Jesus as the crucified, risen, exalted Lord sitting at the right hand of God the Father in the glory of God himself. James doesn't think of Jesus as his earthly brother, though he had the right to do so. Just as we mustn't think of Jesus merely as an earthly teacher, uh, an earthly prophet of some kind, James sees Jesus as the Lord and himself as servant. And then he makes that powerful point that all earthly comparisons between human beings, between rich and poor, powerful and weak, are meaningless for Christians. No matter how important we may think someone else is, no matter how important we may think we are, we are all tiny in comparison to the Lord Jesus Christ of the glory. That's the great lesson of James. From unbeliever to martyr to teacher of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.